All right, so for those of you guys who just came in, there's a couple handouts. A couple handouts up front if you'd like. One is just a copy of the PowerPoint slides for those of you guys who like to have hard copies as we're going through the talk. But I also have a screener um, for executive functioning difficulties um, that you yourself might experience as a parent. And part of that is um, to help make this presentation a little bit more applied. So I know some of you guys have probably been to this conference a number of times, and I may be a familiar face, um, having worked with Dr. Tartaglia for a number of years. And what I wanted to just get is a show of hands of those of you guys who may have seen this presentation before or have seen me talk before. Okay, so just a couple of you, great. So for those of you who've been here before, you may notice some similarities in the slides that I'm presenting, um, but I have tried to make this a little bit more of an applied presentation. So my hope is today um, that I'd really encourage you as we're talking about these difficulties to think about one tiny aspect of your child's life that if you could change would make the world of difference. If you woke up tomorrow morning and your child was able to do X, that you would know that life was going to be better. Um, so clearly these can't be far-reaching, huge projects like, I wish that he was better organized, or I wish that she was never late. Those are probably too extensive for this little exercise that we're going to do today. But things like, I just wish she'd remember to turn in her homework the next day, or I wish that he could remember to put his backpack in a certain place. But those are tiny goals that my hope is that as we go through the different areas of executive functioning, that we'll be able to give you guys some strategies to take home and to, um, to apply to your own daily life. Okay? Do you guys have any questions before we get started? Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background of who I am for those of you guys who might not know me. Um, so my name is Krista Utaf Lee. I'm um, a pediatric neuropsychologist here at Children's Hospital. Um, I worked a number of years with Dr. Tartagli and recently returned from fellowship and was very fortunate to be um, offered a position as a faculty member here. And so just to give you guys that information. Um, so as a part of that, I do a lot of the neuropsychological assessments that um, can work with kiddos with different um, XY chromosome variations. So today what we're going to talk about is a very common complaint for parents um, is executive functioning skills or planning, organization, goal-directed behaviors to get an idea of what can we do to help with these skills. Some of that is going to just be defining what are executive functioning skills, discussing how brain development relates to the development of these skills, um, and understanding um, from a developmental perspective, what do we expect children to be able to do at different ages? Because you expect very different things of a four-year-old than you may of a 14-year-old. And helping you guys as parents know, when is this a deficit and when is this just a developmentally appropriate behavior? And then we'll talk at length about um, some executive functioning interventions. So these idea, um, the idea of the presentation is helping with foundations of success. So kind of playing off the theme of the conference. Executive functioning skills, again, are a set of skills that we think help with goal-directed behavior, with regulation of emotions. And so you can see a number of different ideas um, that we have. So we have persistence to task, initiating tasks, regulating your emotions, time management, inhibiting behavior, um, organization, working memory, flexibility, planning, and attention. And then this idea of metacognition, or kind of pulling everything together to be able to really complete a task. And we'll talk about each of these skills individually, but the idea is really behind that these are kind of pillars of different skill, um, skills that we know help um, a child or an individual be successful. And some of them, um, you can have strengths in, and some of you, you can have weaknesses in. So thinking about kind of your own strengths and weaknesses, when you're looking at these skills, you might think like, oh, I'm really great at X, but maybe I'm not really great at that. And those are things to know about yourself, but then also to recognize in your child as well. So we think about a set of thinking skills. And so these include planning, so this ability to be able to develop a plan, to organize um, yourself and the materials that you're going to need um, to be able to complete a task, to manage the time that you have to be able to complete a task, um, so procrastination, leaving things to the last minute, knowing um, how to plan sufficiently for the amount of time it might take you to do something. Um, the ability to hold information in mind, so working memory, and then this metacognition. So the ability to monitor where you are and to evaluate how much progress you're making towards your goal and do you need to make changes to that so that you can then be able to be more successful in completing your goal. 
We also have behavioral executive functioning skills, so inhibition, so this ability to think before you act, um, being able to regulate your own emotions, so you're really disappointed because when you got to the coffee store, they were out of your favorite flavor, but you're able to kind of regulate that emotion. Um, sustained attention, so even though this may be a boring presentation, that you're able to kind of regulate yourself. Um, the initiation, so getting started on a task, even though it may not be your favorite thing to do. Um, being flexible when things come up or when, you know, your boss walks into the room and gives you another project, even though you ha know you have another one that needs to be done. Being able to switch between those two tasks. And then the persistence of being able to really follow through and complete the things that need to be done. So those are kind of executive skills and the definition of the, the different sets of skills that we're thinking about when we're looking at present um, at executive functioning. And you guys have questions or thoughts about any of these skill areas? Okay. Um, so these set of skills are mediated by brain development and by specific, specific um, parts of the brain. So the frontal lobes or the prefrontal regions play the largest role in the implementation of executive functioning skills. And these um, skills are mediated by different areas of the brain and, and the um, prefrontal cortex is kind of connected to a lot of different areas to really help be able to um, kind of have a real time um, change in behavior and things like that. And what we know is that there, if there's strong connections between areas of the brain that are responsible for motivation, for motor planning, um, for processing sensory information, um, for perceptions of how we view the world, and then for our knowledge base. And so what we bring to the table from our verbal knowledge and things like that. Um, so we also know that as a kiddo gets older, their brain um, develops um, more. And we see development in a couple of different ways. So there's myelination, which is in this increasing kind of insulation between the neurons so that the tra um, kind of the highways between different parts of the brain become um, faster and more efficient. But we also have pruning or, or maturation of different areas of the brain where things that maybe aren't as efficient get taken away. Um, and executive functioning skills progress very slowly. So we see levels of executive functioning skills in children, like in, um, even as young as infants, where they're able to um, sustain their attention to a task or when they're able to switch between different ideas. But obviously, we wouldn't give a six-month-old a homework assignment and expect them to complete that independently. But these are things that we see develop over time. Um, and they continue roughly until this kind of third decade of life, where we're really seeing development into early adulthood. And I think that that's a real important distinction to make, is that even if your, um, your child who recently graduated from high school may not have all of these sets in place, we still have some time for them to really be laid down and completed. Yes, sir. Is that, is that only for um, high developers or kids or whatever, or is this everybody is in the third decade? Yes, yeah, so everybody. So normal brain development in the prefrontal regions continues until your third decade of life. And so there have been some thoughts that maybe that this is even delayed in individuals who have sex chromosome variations. That's an excellent question. Other clarifying questions that you guys might have at this point? Okay. Um, so this is one of the um, kind of comics that I like to show. Um, and so the, the mom is talking a little bit about the prefrontal cortex, and the dad is like, the what? She said, it's a section of the brain responsible for emotional control, impulse restraint, and rational decision making. According to the article, it doesn't fully mature until a person is into his late teens or early 20s. And then comes in the adolescent, and he says, does anybody know a good way to get transmission fluid stains out of an antique gravy boat? <laughs> And the mom is like, if he lives that long. <laughs> and so I think this is really recognizing that this is a, a conflict in adolescence for most parents. And so I hope that that's encouraging for a lot of you guys and that you're not alone in these frustrations. That regardless of the medical diagnosis that your child may carry, that this is a very typical part of adolescence, is really helping children to understand and adolescents to understand executive functioning skills and how to implement those and plan and organize their daily life. Um, so for those of you who were at Dr. Gede's talk yesterday, this may be a familiar kind of um, picture, but what we're generally looking at again is those two different areas of brain maturation. So this being the gray matter which we see um, develop and mature over time, but we also have white matter connections which increase over the course of a child's life. 
Um, so not only are we seeing kind of structural maturation, but then also increasing connections between different parts of the brain. Um, and we, I won't go into depth with these guys, but I think sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And so what you can see over time is that in both of these areas, the, as blue is getting much more mature, that you are seeing these, this development over time um, with this idea of as we get into our 20s, that our brain is looking much different than it did when we were in our um, early childhood. And the same idea here is that we're seeing that you can just see that from the different colors that they have become more represented over time. Okay. So the development of executive functioning skills. So when a little kiddo is little, a lot of this comes from the outside world. So you as parents, teachers, family members, we give a child a lot of direction. We tell them what to do, we plan their life, we organize things for them to do with the hopes that over time we're going to see this become a more intrinsic skill, that they're going to be able to plan on their own, that they're going to be able to organize their own life more efficiently. So I talk about kind of normal expectations for executive functioning skills in childhood. So when your child is in preschool, we would expect them to be able to run simple errands. Can you please go get your shoes out of your room? We expect them <laughs> to, maybe they don't do that, but we expect them to be able to straighten up their room with some assistance. So you're in there and you're helping them. Okay, remember your Legos go in that special box we put over there. Could you go do that for me? Um, performing simple chores like taking their cup to the sink. Um, and inhibiting some behaviors, so hopefully not running into the street, um, making sure that they know that they need your hand when you guys are walking across a crosswalk or something like that. So those are um, kind of developmentally from a four to five year old what we might expect. We have increased demands as a child would enter kindergarten or second grade, so expecting them to be able to run more multi-step directions, so go get your shoes and your jacket and maybe meet me at the front door. Um, being able to clean up some of their personal space, um, performing simple chores like helping feed the dog or um, you know, clean up some of the room, their room and things like that. Um, bringing papers, papers to and from school so that they're starting to be able to recognize that that permission slip to go on the fun field trip on Friday is something that mom has to sign and then has to be taken back to the teacher. Um, that they're completing some early homework assignments with support. Um, and money management is something that we start to see emerging during um, this age group where it's not something that you're going to give them five dollars and tell them to go wild, but that they might understand that money is needed to buy things at stores. And so you might not end up in the car with your kiddo having a new object that you didn't purchase. Um, and then this idea of, again, inhibiting those behaviors. That would be um, things that we would hope that they wouldn't do as children. Um, in grades three to five, again, ever-increasing skills where you guys can see some of the same things, but what we're seeing is that the tasks are becoming more complex and that the level of independence that we expect a child to have is getting um, higher. So that now, not only are they expected to complete homework assignments, but you might expect them to do that more independently. Um, that you're expecting them to start keeping track of longer range planning assignments. So you have a big, a big book report that's due in a couple of weeks. So let's make sure that we're, getting, we're breaking that assignment down into different steps. Um, that they're starting to save money for projects or purchases that they might want to do. And that they're getting better at emotionally and behaviorally regula regulating themselves. So that in the um, face of frustration, I'm sorry it's raining today, we won't be able to go to the park that they're able to regulate that um, disappointment a little bit better. Same thing again, going through into the middle school ages where we're expecting more organizational um, skills and more planning skills. And this is the time when a lot of children start to um, fall apart and that middle school changes a lot, right? So you have multiple teachers, you have longer um, assignments, and school personnel are less willing to be supportive um, in the way that they might have been able to do during elementary school um, because they expect a child to be more independent in that way. Um, there's the idea of kind of starting to plan to be able to make sure that they have enough time to complete certain activities and with our hope of being able to inhibit this rule breaking um, uh, um, in the absence of you guys being there so that they start to be more involved in social activities um, without the um, presence of an adult and really hoping that they're going to make those good choices. 
into high school, we see kind of establishment of long-term goals and how that's going to help them be able to manage their schoolwork and making good, time, um, good choices during their leisure time, um, inhi inhibiting reckless and dangerous behaviors um, that might get them into trouble. So, so those are kind of typically in an ideal world, these are the set of skills that we would expect for each age range. Some of them, you guys can imagine, would be, um, uh, for some kids, they come online pretty easily and pretty quickly. But other kiddos might struggle a little bit. And so what we tend to see is that there's some variability in executive functioning skills so that the trajectory of the development can be influenced by a lot of different things, some of them being the genetics that the child brings to the table, some of it being the environment. So if you think about kind of the environment the child's growing up in, maybe you are a super organized mom or a super organized dad, and so you guys are able to really help foster the development of those skills. You're keeping them on track, and they're getting all their assignments turned in because you're really help, helping to mediate some of those. Um, any trauma or injury, so individuals who might have sustained a traumatic brain injury, if there's been um, certain um, other neurological conditions like seizure disorders and things that might complicate this picture a little bit. Um, and other mental health or behavioral disabilities, so thinking about how attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD um, or anxiety or depression can play into a child's ability to really be able to plan and organize their life without adult support. It's also important to remember that these occur along a continuum. So if you think about your own skills, when you guys are looking at that questionnaire that I um, had provided for you today, you may recognize that there's some areas that you're really good as a parent in. You know, I'm really a great planner. But you know what, when it comes to regulating disappointment, eh, that's a little bit harder for me. Or maybe it's a reverse. And I think it's important to recognize that we all have strengths and weaknesses in this area. And um, recognizing that in yourself and in your child can be very important so that you can help to promote the development of the strengths to help compensate for some of the difficulties that they may experience. We also see the demands for executive functioning um, change over time. Um, so we have this idea of increased demands as a child gets a little bit older, and the idea that the context is willing to be less supportive. So the teachers, um, even parents, become less willing to be um, as supportive because they expect a child to become more independent as they go through time. And what we see is this period of time which really coincides with middle school. Um, so there's this breakdown in the child's ability to be independent and to do the things by him or herself in, in middle school, partly because um, school, the school structure changes so much and teachers really do expect the child to be much more independent at that age. We also see executive functioning skills um, or deficits occur when the child's skills don't match the environmental demands. Um, and they become more apparent as a child gets a little bit older and these demands for independent behaviors increase. Um, we also see um, executive functioning deficits in the context of you know, a stressful situation. So maybe you guys tend to be pretty good planners and organizers, but you know, when you have 10 projects at work and your family's coming in town um, and your kid has three recitals at school, those might be times that even your own executive functioning skills are stressed and you notice the pile of paperwork on your desk is getting a little bit bigger and maybe your kitchen looks a little bit messier. And those are things that are important to recognize is that there's some variability just with demands um, for everybody, even people who have um, very efficient executive functioning skills. All right, so that was kind of the first part, the, br the brief overview of everything that we are going to talk about with executive functioning skills. Do you guys have questions or thoughts about anything so far? Yes, ma'am. How do you communicate that to the school? Because we've had that problem where they say, well, this is what we expect out of all the kids in the school. Right. Right. And how do you I think that's an excellent question. So for those of you guys who didn't hear, the idea is how do we communicate with the school, especially if we're not, if maybe the school doesn't know about the child's diagnosis, and how do we help them understand that your, um, your child may benefit from some of these interventions? And I think we touch, I'll touch 
um, based on those a little bit through some of these um, environmental interventions that we can help do. Um, and then Dr. Riley has a really nice presentation after lunch. Um, and I think that those could, that could be a great presentation for those of you guys who are experiencing difficulties with the school. Um, so she's going to talk specifically about special education law and how to really help advocate for your child in the school. So hopefully between the later half of this presentation and then that presentation, you will have a better idea of that. So I'm going to just put you off just a little bit. But then you would also have a question? Yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering, with plant over syndrome, um, are, are they often um, executive functioning delays or are they deficits? So that's a great question. We tend to see um, that children with Klinefelter's or some of the other sex chromosome um, variations um, do have difficulties. And we think of them as deficits, that this is going to be kind of a lifelong area that they're going to struggle with. Does that mean that it's always going to be an area of weakness? It just may mean that they need compensatory strategies to be able to help with them. Um, but I know that there's still a lot of ongoing research in this area to really help us understand, is it maybe a cognitive delay, where if some of the brain areas are maturing later, then it may be something that we are going to see some improvement in. But for having worked with a number of patients, my um, experience has been that they do tend to be longer standing concerns. And just one more question before we keep going. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's back on this one. Sure. Um, Yes, so that's a great question. So we are always kids with executive functioning skills. We kind of lend them our frontal lobe when they're little, right? We make sure that they are always supervised. We make sure that they're given um, strategies to um, be safe in the environment. We put little plugs in the um, outlet holes so that they don't do things that would get them into trouble. And so it may be that for your adolescent, we're having to um, prolong that period of kind of lending that there are frontal lobes to them. And we will talk about the idea of how to scaffold some of those skills, I think that that can be really important. So let's just kind of jump in and talk a little bit about executive functioning interventions in the time that we have left. Um, so these interventions, again, are designed to help compensate for some of the difficulties, but they do require active support from you guys as parents and participation. It's not something that we can give a child a list of things to do, tape it to their desk, and think that life is going to be better. That these are really hands-on activities, and they're going to, for the most part, require a lot from you guys as families and parents um, to be able to really foster the development of these skills. Um, they do depend on the individual. So the characteristics of the child, um, the setting that you guys might be in, and then the task demands. So it's not uncommon for me to hear about um, parents say, gosh, we had this teacher and she was just disorganized. Like I would get like a, a bunch of hot papers and, and then she was telling us that there were things that were due and then she was changing them. So sometimes you can have teachers with executive functioning difficulties and I think that that can change how you help your child interact with the environment as well. Um, so this is kind of looking at some of the different mismatches that we can have between executive functioning skills, between your skills as a parent and the child's skills. And so what you see is that we, you can, um, it can be an area of strength for both of you guys. So maybe you're both really good at inhibiting your responses. So you guys tend to not, you know, yell when you're driving if someone cuts you off. And your child's pretty good at not getting frustrated if something happens. Um, Maybe um, as a strength, you're a pretty good planner, but maybe your kiddo, not such a great planner. Um, and then maybe it's an area of weakness for both of you guys. And so that, you know, historically, planning has been a little bit more challenging for you as well when you were younger, and you're noticing some very similar traits in your child. Um, and so for those of you guys who've had a chance to look over that handout that I gave you, I think that that can be something that's really helpful to recognize in yourself, um, because it gives us a couple of strategies. So if it's a weakness for both of you guys, you can say, oh, isn't that funny, buddy? I, str I struggled with the same thing when I was younger. And kind of make light of it and say, well, these are the things that I found really helpful for me. Why don't we try them with you and see how they go? Um, if you know it's a strength for you and a weakness for your child, maybe you guys can develop an agreement. So, you know, honey, I've really noticed that you're struggling a little bit more with planning. So how about every Monday night we sit down together and we lay out what, you, what assignments you have due this week. And we think about how long they're going to take you and some deadlines and breaking things down so that you're going to be able to finish them. And that can be helpful. 
Um, and then if it's a strength for both of you guys, then hopefully it's not a concern. But it's nice to recognize that you guys both have these areas of strength. Of course, the one that's missing from this is if it was a weakness for you and a strength for your child. Um, but that's something that, you know, we're not going to worry about too much right now. <laughs> so questions or thoughts about... What's that? It's outside of my scope, right? We're here for the kids. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is kind of break down some different ways of teaching executive functioning skills. Okay. Um, so this is kind of another comment to kind of um, let, give you guys an idea of... Um, some, how my life can be at times. So the, um, this is a postdoctoral student, and she says, I'll be just a minute. And the other guy says, geez, how do you find anything in this, sh this mess? And she says, oh, I know it looks chaotic, but it's all carefully organized in an intricate pile system. So there's my research paper pile, my class stuff pile, my bank stuff pile. And he says, what's this pile over here? And he says, well, I don't know which pile to put it in pile. And so that that's something that, you know, things change and that organizational strategies in a very demanding environment can be hard to put in place and recognizing that even for those of us who don't necessarily have executive functioning deficits, that if our brains are stretched enough that these can become deficits or look like we have deficits. So recognizing that mismatch between the environment and your child can be important as well. So different ways to teach um, executive functioning interventions. So one, again, I'm going to really highlight the idea that these are skills that need to be taught. For some of us, we bring to the table a set of skills that we just implicitly understand. We don't need to spend a lot of time understanding how to develop organizational systems, but that's just how our brain functions. Um, but that isn't how everybody's brains function, brains function, is that they really do tend to need some support in these areas. We also want to think about what we've talked about at length today's development. Are the expectations that you have for your child age appropriate? So are you expecting your five-year-old to bring home their homework independently, to complete all of their homework by themselves, and then to return it um, to the teacher without any problems? And that might be outside of the expectation that we would have for a five-year-old, but within expectations for a 14-year-old. And so then we're recognizing it as an area of weakness and something that we want to um, help with. There's also the idea of um, transitioning from external to internal support, so that you as a parent are going to have to provide a lot of support initially, but then we're going to gradually ho um, hope to see that this, the child will start to internalize some of these um, strategies so that you can start to gradually let go of some of those responsibilities over time. Um, we also see the changes in the environment, so recognizing that now your kiddo's in sixth grade and the teacher's a little bit more challenging um, and the expectations are a little bit different, and so we might need to change the strategies that your child's been using over time. Um, using your child's desire to be independent um, to be to, as something as a catalyst to help really put these strategies in place. So gosh, I know you really want to do this by yourself, so let's figure out how we can do that. Um, modifying tasks, providing incentives, and then as always being supportive as a child um, develops these skills. All right, here we go, sorry. So there's two levels of intervention that we like to talk about. One is intervention at the level of the environment. And so these are ways that we set the stage as parents, as professionals, to make sure that a child's going to be um, productive. And so every night you might check your child's um, backpack to make sure that all their homework is in place so that in the morning rush that things don't get forgotten on the kitchen table. A teacher may have a specific little basket that kids have to put all their homework in, and that's a part of the routine every morning. Um, we provide models and scaffolds to help with this idea of what we expect um, and give them external support so that um, we can reduce those over the course um, of development. So the kindergarten teacher or the first grade teacher may have that homework basket, but chances are a middle school teacher doesn't have that, but she may expect it to just be placed on her desk or his desk at the end of the day. And we can also do intervention at the level of the child. So um, giving very specific instructions about different strategies that the child can use to help develop these skills. And in a way, giving them a toolkit of strategies to use. So that in an event where um, you know, we need to get our, um, a big um, book report done by next week, let's break that down into smaller tasks. Let's make a list of the things that you need to do um, to be able to accomplish that goal so that it's not you know, Thursday night and all of a sudden we're remembering that we have a book report that's due at the end by, um, by tomorrow morning. 
Um, so we can have some gen general principles for environmental intervention. So again, increasing the structure of the environment. Um, so making sure that as family members that you are really um, giving the child a quiet environment to work on, um, that there's maybe a desk that's put somewhere in the, in the house that's a nice um, distraction-free environment for them to focus on. Um, establishing very simple and consistent routines. So once your kiddo comes home from school, they're given a half an hour of free time and then asked to do their homework so that every day they know that that's the routine and that they're able to do that. Um, changing kind of the physical or social environment. So Dr. Tartaglia had mentioned about preferential seating and you know having a kiddo in the front of the class versus the back of the class where we can really help play on some of those, um, make, making sure that there's attention supports. Um, changing the nature of the task if we need to, so advocating with teachers for shorter assignments, um, assignments that might be a little bit more closed-ended so that, you know, we're going to break down that book report into like, you know, by Tuesday the kiddo needs to have read the book rather than saying like, okay, go write a book report, but we're going to give them very concrete goals to be able to um, be successful in the task that they're asked to complete. <laughs> And then we change the ways that we interact with students and children so that we as parents might see, gosh, I know they have a book report on Friday, but I haven't seen him do anything for it. In fact, I know that we haven't even gone to the library to check out the book yet. And anticipating those problems and being able to intervene with your own executive functioning skills to help avoid that crisis on Thursday evening. We can also think about you know, ways to help them in school, so providing outlines of lecture notes. So if we know that listening to an entire lecture um, from the teacher might be very challenging, that we can help um, advocate for um, provision of, of notes. And so a lot of times we don't want just the notes to be given, like here you go, here's what I'm gonna talk about today, because then there's no motivation for the kiddo to listen to the lecture, right? Um, and so oftentimes what we'll say is um, asking the teachers to have blanks in their um, presentations, and I actually did this when I was teaching undergraduates, um, where I would have PowerPoint slides, but then they're missing certain parts or key words so that you can increase the level of attention. Like they have to be paying attention to the lecture, but the demands are much lower so that they're not scribbling down every single word the professor is saying, but that they're able to um, really focus on some of the key terms and be able to really process that information more um, deeply. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that is just Yeah, it isn't. You know, I mean, it, it, it's one of those great theories, and I, I struggle with, with note-taking in my students, like, non-stop. Yeah. Because I see the issue that you say. Yeah. You get in and pay attention. Yeah. And so the, the issue is that te um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of advocacy about this, but that teachers sometimes don't do it. And, and I agree, I think we do need to recognize that in a lot of ways our public school system is taxed and that um, teachers are, have a lot of increased responsibilities and they have a lot of students. Um, and I think um, encouraging them to try to do this, these are good strategies for all of their students. And it was an extra piece of thing, it was an extra work, um, aspect of work for me to do when I was um, working with, young, with um, college students. But I think that it's something that um, if we recognize the importance of it and how helpful it can be for teachers, um, that it's something that they can start to incorporate into their daily life. And, you know, some of that may be, you know, asking about, like, are there other things that, you know, other teachers could help with? Or are there things that, you know, there may be um, resources through the teaching society that would help alleviate some of the difficulties that young teachers might experience. But my, um, my experience having worked in the schools for a number of years has been that young teachers specifically don't implement some of these strategies because they just don't have the time. And so I think recognizing that and helping advocate for your child is something that can be helpful, um, although it's not a perfect science, and you're exactly right, that it is something that can be difficult to do. Yes, sir? Recognizing that you can't necessarily change the teacher, yeah. uh, but advocating for your child, what you can do, uh, speaking to the school counselor or mm -hmm. the principal, is find out which teacher are already implementing yes. some of the strategies that might be more beneficial for your child. Absolutely. And try to get your child into those particular teacher's classes. 
Absolutely, and I think that that's something that's a very great strategy and something that we recommend a lot through our clinic is that if you know in the school that your ch that there's a specific teacher who's just um, a minefield of difficulty, that you may try to advocate for your child not being in that classroom, and I agree with that. Um, I see there's a couple of other hands. I'm going to ask you guys to hold on just a minute for me, um, partly because I want to make sure that we get through the rest of the exercises, so I'm sorry about that, but please hold on to your questions and we'll get to them at the end, okay? Um, so just a couple of other environmental interventions. Again, remembering that this is one aspect of a way to promote executive functioning skills. Um, so breaking down some of those long-term assignments, which I've already alluded to, providing scaffolding. Um, so breaking down the goals that you have for your child. I really want them to be able to remember their homework assignment by themselves. And so I'm going to break it down into some very concrete behavioral steps. So we're going to talk about how to do it the first couple of days. I'm going to be you know, right there and making sure that we're doing it together. And then I'm going to give them some skills and see how they can do it on their own. And if I need to jump in or to modify my behavior, I will. But then with the hope of withdrawing some of that support as the child gets a little bit older. Having repeated presentations, model, modeling the behaviors that you would like to see. So, gosh, you know, honey, I have this really big project at work today. I'm going to sit down and write, um, you know, all the goals that I need to do by the next week. Why don't we do that together? So you have a big project coming up, too. Why don't we both write down kind of how to break down these um, big assignments into little pieces? Um, using multiple modes to present information. So a lot of times, especially for kids with attention difficulties, just attending a lecture can be very challenging. And so encouraging them to um, you know, think about multimedia, um, even if you guys as families, well, gosh, I know you're learning about um, you know, uh, the Civil War. There's a great Civil War exhibit at the museum this week. Let's go there together and look at the different ideas that we can look at. Or YouTube and some of the internet resources that are out there. Any way to really help um, you know, provide additional experiences about topics that kids are learning about. Um, using manipulatives can be helpful. And then review the expectations of the assignment with the child. So helping make sure that they really truly understand what's expected of them and what, they, what an ideal project would look like. So I remember working with a little second grader who knew he had a big science fair project that was due. It included a big poster board that he needed to do. But he didn't really fully understand that there needed to be different topics or different sections of this poster presentation. And so when it really came, he was thinking like, gosh, that's only going to take me five minutes. It won't be a big deal. But then when he really saw what he had to do, he was like, I can't do this. I only have 10 minutes. You know? And that was something that was um, very stressful for him, partly because he misunderstood the real expectations of the, of the assignment. Um, so other environmental interventions, and these I think will address some of the questions that you guys have about how do we um, negotiate with the school to be able to give these interventions. And I think that Dr. Riley's um, presentation will be helpful um, to really flesh out some of these ideas, but just to briefly cover some of them. So there are a couple of different ways you can get interventions through the school. One is to have a 504 plan, which is through the American with Disabilities Act. Um, so it provides accommodations within the general classroom. Um, for children who have disabilities. So should you choose to share your child's medical diagnosis or if your child has a diagnosis of ADHD, that this is a way to get services um, through the general education classroom. So these focus on accommodations. So we may give preferential seating where the child's put in the front of the classroom. We may be willing to give extended time or to help break down assignments into smaller pieces. So we change some of the environment, but they don't give modification. So we're not going to um, you know, really give them extra study groups. We're not going to help them with reading instruction if that's an area of weakness. But these are really looking more at formal accommodations. We have an increased level of support when we move into the special education department through an individualized education program or plan or program um, or an IEP. These are formal accommodations and modifications that are provided through special education. So for those of you guys who might be familiar, it can be speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, looking at um, help through a resource room where the child's getting extra support, but then also some different modifications, so shortening expectations um, and things like that. It can also include some of the accommodations that are provided through a 504 plan. So those are different ways to look at skills. If you're concerned that your child is really struggling in school, you as parents can always request a special education evaluation. The word for it is a full and individual evaluation um, through the school district. Um, that is kind of the 
formal federal term. It's listed as very, um, it's uh, called different things in different states. Um, so just to let you guys know about that. But you can do that even with our current educational system um, by submitting a, re um, a written request to the school, which then starts a timeline for them to be able to do. Um, but again, Dr. Riley will talk more extensively about those interventions, but just so that you guys know that those are ways to help advocate for some of these services within the school district. So the other thing that I like to talk about when we're talking about executive functioning skills is this ABCs of behavioral modification. Um, so we have a behavior that a child might have. Um, so what, does anybody have one that they'd like to throw out? A specific behavior that maybe your child does. Yes, ma'am. Getting out of bed in the morning, that's a terrific one. Okay, so we might have some antecedents or things that come before the behavior or this difficulty getting out of bed in the morning. So what might those be? Reasons that your child might have difficulty getting out of bed. Gaming all night. Yes, so they stay up till 2 in the morning playing Halo. <coughs> what else? They don't want to go to school. They don't want to go to school. Okay, so that, um, that would be a good, uh, so emotionally, like school's not so fun, so they don't want to be there. What else? They sleep in the middle of the night. Okay, so sleep difficulties. And I didn't hear the other one. Is that what you guys said as well? Okay. So, so, so um, that they're waking up, that they're not sleeping well, they're not well rested, and they're feeling tired in the morning. Maybe they were on Facebook at 2 in the morning. Maybe, um, you know, they, they um, stayed up late talking to their friend last night because of an, a crisis or something that happened. And so those influence the behavior of not wanting to get out, in the be out of bed in the morning. We also have consequences. So some of those consequences of not getting out of bed in the morning without your prompting could be, what kind of things do they... What's the benefits of not getting out of bed in the morning? Extra sleep. Extra sleep. So there's 10 extra minutes while you guys, between the time that you've come in to wake them up, that's 10 extra minutes of sleep, right? That feels pretty good at 5 or 6 in the morning when your kids are getting up. Um, what are some other consequences of behavior? Not having to deal with the bus right between school. Yes. So if I sleep in, then I miss the bus, then I don't have to go to school, and life's a little bit better for me that day. Um, of course, down the line, there's probably longer consequences of missing school. Um, but so those are things to really keep in mind as you're focusing on some of the deficits that your child might be experiencing. So if one of the concerns is procrastination, it can be it's really important to look at what are some of the antecedents or the causes of that behavior that comes before. So maybe they don't have the skills to be able to do the tasks. And I think that doc, the case that Dr. Tartaglia brought up was really important, is that that child didn't have the skills to be able to complete the tasks that her teachers were expecting her to do. And so that could be something that's happening. Um, it could be that there's a, a struggle between the, the child and the teacher relationship, that maybe that's not a great fit. Um, maybe the assignments are um, not presented in a way that the kid really understands what's expected. And so knowing those um, kind of precursors to that procrastination can be helpful. And then knowing the consequences. So if, I'm a pro if I procrastinate on getting my task done, it means I get to watch um, the TV show that I really like to watch tonight. So um, I know that someone who was talking about his very high-functioning, typically developing kiddo um, who wanted to watch The Voice instead of doing her homework. And then she was staying up until 11 o'clock at night doing her homework because she had gotten to do what she wanted to do first. And those are things to really help the kiddo understand that, you know, if you watch this TV show, you're going to be up really late at night doing the things you need to do. So helping them understand the, um, the, um, the, um, Sorry, I'm thinking of the word. Um, the differences between the different levels of support that they may need or the choices that they're going to make. Other questions or thoughts at this point? So what I want to spend is a little bit of time on the child-based interventions, things that you guys can do as parents um, to help support the development of these skills. And I know that we're going to go just a little bit over, but we started a little bit late, so hopefully that's okay with you guys. Um, but some of the things we're going to look at the different areas or the different aspects of um, executive functioning skills. So we'll start with inhibition. So we have some external modifications that you guys can see there. So again, increasing some of the structure, increasing supervision, um, providing cues to help increase self-control. So remember, we look before we cross the street and making sure that you're out in the front yard when your kid is playing and things like that. That if, you're, if you know that your kid has a tendency to just rush into things, that you're going to want to make sure that you're supervising them a little bit closer. 
and then teaching those skills again. So providing cues, like when you're walking together, oh, I see that here's a street that's coming up. What do we do before we cross the street? And you guys have done these things as parents. You've heard other parents do them. We look both ways, and so the kid can start to recite these mantras of things that I do in certain situations. And that's a part of normal parenting, but it's something that, again, you may prolong into early adolescence with some of your kids. So I'm, you know, what do we do when you have a big assignment coming up and really helping those um, skills be reinforced? Um, ignoring undesirable behavior, so kind of the idea of picking your battles. So maybe your kid is really impulsive and they just tend to blurt things out when you're talking on the phone. But if you give attention to that behavior, then you reinforce it so that they know if I interrupt mom when she's on the phone, she'll give me the attention that I want immediately, rather than knowing like, gosh, if I don't, then I have to wait a few minutes. So and then gradually reducing those supports over time. So working memory, again, that idea of holding things in mind. Um, and so these are ways that we have some really nice strategies nowadays with some of the um, electronic planners we have. So we all have, a lot of people have smartphones nowadays, and a lot of kids even are having smartphones where you can set an alarm for a, uh, a certain reminder, you can make to-do lists with things um, even on your smartphone and things that, like, um, that they're not having to worry about losing to-do lists that they might have scratched down on a napkin or something like that. Um, the alarms can have um, physical cues, so they, they can vibrate at a certain time, even if they're in class and they need to remember to take their medication or something like that. Um, and those are great strategies, I think, as families, to really incorporate that as much as possible. And then teaching the skills, so explaining the concerns that need to be addressed and providing options. So, you know, it's really important that you take your medication. How can we um, support you doing that? So I can remind you every day, or we can set an alarm, or I can get you one of those pill boxes, and, you know, we can make, I can, I'll check it every night to make sure you've taken it and stuff like that. Um, and then developing a monitoring system so that you as a parent are able to really provide the stru structures that they might need for you and to practice those strategies together. Um, we also talk about external um, kind of modifications for emotional control. So these again are just, it's all, it's very normal to be disappointed. It's very normal to be angry in the, um, you know, when confronted with things that didn't go the way that you wanted to, but giving them the appropriate ways to be able to express those emotions. Um, so doing a couple, one, some of the things we can do as parents is to anticipate problems. So, you know, you know that your child really wants to play with a certain child in school, but you know that that kid is out of um, town this weekend because their parents mentioned something to you about it before. And so really setting the stage when your kiddo's like, okay, we're going to have a sleepover this weekend and saying like, gosh, you know, I think that so-and-so might be out of town. Why don't we think about inviting another friend over? Um, teaching coping skills, and so looking at some of the psychological um, literature that's out there for relaxation strategies and things that we can help to do um, to give the child some self-regulatory skills. Um, providing social scripts, so things that um, a kiddo can do by him or herself to be able to um, address certain conflicts that might come up at school. So if a teacher um, you know, calls on them in class and that makes them very anxious, things that they can say to be able to reduce that anxiety. Oh, just give me a minute, I'm trying to think of what I want to say. Or can you come back to me? And giving them permission to be able to know what to say in those situations. And providing them reinforcement. So. Um, when you say no about, you know, that they can't have a specific candy bar in the grocery store and they actually do a really good job of regulating their disappointment, that you can say, gosh, you did a nice job with that. I think that we can go to the park for a little bit on the way home um, and giving them some reinforcement for the actual behaviors that you do want to see <coughs> when they are able to um, display them. And then teaching the skills, again, explaining what it is and giving them cueing. So remember, we talked about that we weren't going to get candy today at the grocery store or um, giving them expectations before they go into a certain setting. So today we're going to go to your sister's dance recital. It's really important that we're quiet and that we sit in our seat. Um, and those are things that we want to see so that they have good behavioral um, expectations before they go into a setting. Um, sustained attention, so outlining time requirements, um, specifying kind of how long it might take you to do something, using a timer. Um, so maybe your kiddo really struggles at being able to know how long it's going to take them for their math homework. And so you can start w by working with them and saying like, okay, on Monday, let's start a timer. Let's see how long does it take you to finish your math. Okay, it took 15 minutes today. All right, let's do this for a whole week. And so that that way they can know my homework takes 15 minutes or, or 45 minutes so that 
they're able to start to plan for their day so that they don't end up with this late night crunch of trying to get all of their homework done at the end of the day. Um, and we've talked about a couple of the other things that you guys can see up there as well as breaking up tasks, providing um, supervision, and helping increase the interest in tasks by using different multimedia aspects to help um, teach in different ways. Um, and with this goal, again, of gradually reducing some of these exter external supports that we're giving. Um, initiation, so getting started. Again, this idea of providing some visual or verbal cues as parents. So remember, don't you want to get started on your homework because you want to watch voice tonight when it's on at 9 or whatever. Um, providing some supports during the initial um, part of the task. So how's it going over there? Are you getting okay? Do you need any help? Um, helping with them um, to develop a work plan so that they're able to be conscientious of their time um, and helping teach them skills about developing to-do lists and written plans and um, providing support and reinforcement to make sure that they're able to begin the task independently. Um, again, with this hope of taking away some of those external modifications over time. We have planning, so again, a lot of these you guys can see overlap to some point. So I'm hoping that as we're going through these different aspects that you guys have a skill in mind that you're trying to um, develop some goals for. So um, reviewing some of the task expectations, breaking down the long-term assignments into smaller parts, completing a template. So when you know you have an essay to write, that these are the different things that you can do as a family or as a child to do. Um, sure, sorry, organization. Um, so these are things that um, are not implicit for some kiddos. So really looking at organizational for rooms. Um, so maybe your adolescent has a really messy room, and so you give them some skills that they can use. Like you know you use your game um, boy all the time, so let's get a little basket, and we'll put that right by your bed and things like that. So that's where it goes every time you're done with it so that you can find it whenever you're looking for it, things like that. Um, and then reinforce the use of the system. So, wow, I really liked that, you know, you put your cell phone on the charger when you came home from school. That's great. Now you'll know where it is in the morning when you need to find it. Um, modeling organizational schemes. So, you know, when you're looking at um, organizing your own house or your own kitchen and like, gosh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use these different ways to do those kind of um, skills so that they're seeing that you're modeling different behaviors. Walking them through problem-solving strategies. So, you know, if we need to have this book, book report to do, what would we do together to be able to figure that out? Um, and then teaching a variety of different schemes. So maybe your kid is really good at being able to hang up their jacket when they come home, um, but now we want to look at um, when they go over to the grandparents' house, or maybe when they go over to their pa other parents' house. That, you know, where do you where do you hang up your jacket when you go there? What kind of things do you do so that when they're um, independent as an adult? that even if the environment has changed, that they're able to have these set of skills that they can transfer into other environments. Time management, so initially providing them with a schedule. Um, so when your child is in first or second grade, you tell them when they do their homework. And you may not be expected to do that as they get a little bit older. Um, but I think that for some of the kids that we know that this is an area of struggle, it can be really helpful to just you know, OK, you do your homework from 4 to 5 o'clock every night. And that way it's done before dinner, and you can do whatever you want after dinner, and things like that. And just automatically putting it at that in place. Um, creating time limits um, so that they have to do things before dinner, so that if they tend to be distracted by Facebook or Twitter and some of the other um, tendencies to multitask with some of the <laughs> social networking sites, that they may know that their homework needs to get done at 5, and so maybe they shouldn't get involved in a chat with their friend on Facebook about what so-and-so said in class today and stuff like that. Um, and then developing cues to help guide task completion. So halfway through, they can see, okay, how many problems have I gotten done? Am I really on target to meet my you know, hour deadline of homework? If I'm not, what can I do to change the behavior that I have? And so just helping them um, develop those strategies and being able to understand the demands that they have. And then discussing potential difficulties with the kiddo can be something that's really helpful. Um, so, you know, I've noticed that, you know, when you're doing your homework that, you know, Sally, your friend from school, keeps writing you on Facebook, and that's really distracting, and then you have to keep restarting your homework. What do you think if we just turned off Facebook for an hour, or if we let Twitter just sit for a few minutes? And, and your initial, their initial response is probably going to be like, no, no, the world is ending, right? Um, but I think that telling them that those are things that you have to do to help regulate your behavior and get things done in an efficient manner can be helpful. And you as parents can also 
um, model that behavior. Like, oh, I really need to get dinner done, but so-and-so keeps messaging me, but I'm going to put the phone over here and let her know that I'll talk to her later because I need to get something done. Um, and those can be things that your kiddo, um, it's very helpful for your child to see modeled. Um, persistence, so providing goals and cues that help um, keep a child on task. So again, a lot of this looks at some of the environmental structure that we can give. So I often hear from parents that um, children and adolescents like to do their homework in their bedrooms when they're listening to music and that that can be something that's very helpful for them or that they perceive it as helpful. Um, but one of the things we know about our brains is that we're not always great multitaskers. Um, and so helping them understand um, that, you know, giving their attention to one task might get it done a little bit quicker. Um, increasing the visibility of the task that they need to do. So when that um, child was needing to do the poster board presentation, really getting a poster board and saying, there needs to be information on this board. It can't take you five minutes to do that. So that they really have kind of a, a more comprehensive view of the expectations for the task. Um, and then providing feedback, like, wow, you're doing a really great job. Let's, let's see what else we can do to um, make sure that the science project gets a little bit um, even better and a little bit more improved. So flexibility is something that a lot of parents express concerns about, that um, children can have difficulty um, before transitions, especially unexpected transitions, um, and helping um, increase their knowledge about what the schedule might look like or if there's going to be changes, um, providing a preview of new information that they might be exposed to at school, um, gradually exposing them to a new situation. So this is something that they're working with um, kindergarten students in Colorado where um, students are actually going to kindergarten two weeks early to practice going to school. Um, so, and they've done this in other countries as well with a lot of success of not having academic instruction as much as understanding that there's certain routines and daily um, schedules that we expect kids to start adhering to. And then gradually um, kind of um, creating social stories for them um, and helping them understand um, and recognize flexibility, discussing imaginary scenarios. So you know you really want to go to this um, play group on Friday, but I don't think we're going to be able to go there. What, what is that going to feel like? What is that going to look like? What else could we do instead? Those kind of deals. And providing scripts for problem solving and teaching relaxation strategies like deep breathing and things like that that we know can be very helpful. And then the last one we're going to talk about is metacognition. Um, and again, this is a really um, kind of fancy term to talk about this idea of being able to bring everything together. So providing direct instruction in self-monitoring and self-evaluative skills, problem solving, error monitoring, and being able to review the task demands so that they are able to internalize some of these skills that can be helpful to be successful in high school and college. Um, helping them develop che checklists, um, developing a set of questions when confronted with a problem. So, you know, what do I do um, when so-and-so bothers me at school? Or what do I do um, if a teacher tells me that I have, haven't turned something in when I think I have? Things like that so that they're able to know the questions that they can ask as a ch um, a and advocate for themselves. So then a couple of ideas for when you guys are thinking about some of the child-based interventions. So I want to describe a target be behavior of concern. So for those of you guys who might have been thinking about a specific behavior, and does anybody want to share theirs with the group? Remember, we were thinking of just that tiny behavior that you want to see changed. Wear underwear. <laughs> Wear underwear. All right. That's a small one. Um, so our, um, our specific goal would that be that we want um, the child to wear underwear every day, right? Yes. Are they wearing underwear any day of the week at this point? Not if they, not if they get away with it. All right. So let's say we're going to start with a small goal. Their goal is to wear underwear the, for three days a week, okay? But that's our goal. Um, so we're going to create a list of actions that need to be completed in order to achieve the goal. So what might those be? All right, great. So those would be environmental structures changes that we're making. So we're making sure as a parent that they have clean underwear in their drawer for them to use. But maybe the drawer is too far away. Maybe they don't really think about it because the underwear is in the drawer instead of on the bed or something like that. So how could we even increase that level of environmental cueing that they need to wear underwear? Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Yes. So for those of you guys who couldn't hear, this idea of laying out all of the clothing that a child might have. 
so that we know that there's underwear, that there's socks, that there's shoes, that everything that needs to happen together is there. Um, so some kiddos can also have sensory issues when there's certain parts of clothing, and I think that that's important to recognize. So maybe I don't like those underwear with the itchy tag in the back, and so as a family, you go and find underwear that feel comfortable for the kiddo so that they're maybe not as resistant to wearing it. And that's also a way to change um, the behaviors that you might see. Yes? What if you try every kind of underwear that there is? So then I think that someone like Sid Martin, who's an occupational therapist, would have wonderful ways to desensitize kiddos to different sensory inputs. And so uh, consulting, and you'll see in a few minutes, consulting a professional and knowing when that's appropriate and when you as a parent have exhausted all of your own tools, when it might be a good idea to bring in other people. Um, so those are great ideas. So what, we're, what you're seeing that we're doing is we're going through these initial phases of teaching, of completing the actions together. So maybe the first day we're going to get dressed together. We're going to say, okay, your underwear go on first and then your pants and things like that. We're going to then maybe remove that a little bit on the second or third day and prompt them, hey, did you put your underwear in or on when you're um, getting dressed? Um, you're going to observe them maybe to make sure that after they've gotten dressed that they really do have their underwear on. Um, provide some feedback. Nice job on that. That was great. You were able to do it all by yourself. I didn't even have to ask today. Um, and then evaluate and make any necessary changes. So gosh, you know, this isn't going as well as I might have wanted to. Maybe we need to change from briefs to boxers. Maybe that would be better. Things like that to be able to make changes as you need to. And with, again, this hope of gradually decreasing the level of support that you need to give. Motivation is another thing that we talk about with child-based um, interventions. So um, we know that a child's motivation, or even our motivations as adults, can be um, affected by the task difficulty and the um, level of task desirability. Um, so we can think of ways to um, increase motivation. So breaking down assignments into more manageable sections, um, providing external support and praise for task completions, and then providing a short break after they've um, completed a certain thing. So maybe they've gotten through the first part of the task um, and giving them um, a, a five minute break to go do what they want to do or to check Facebook for a few minutes after they've completed 10 math problems or something like that. Um, and then this idea of when to consult for additional help. So I think with a lot of the things that we talk about with attention and executive functioning skills, it's very important that we have screened for specific medical issues that might be related to these difficulties. So we know that children who have sleep difficulties are at a greater risk for attention problems. We know that children who have thyroid problems or who maybe have low testosterone have um, fatigue and, and reduced motivation and things like that that can be affected just by their medical um, difficulties. And so something that I think is very important to consult with medical teams about potential issues. Um, medication for attention difficulties is also something that can affect executive functioning skills. So if you think that you're a little bit better to focus on tasks, you can imagine that making a to-do list is a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier for you as a, um, as a child. And those are things that, you know, as a team we don't recommend um, only medication. Medication is a tool in the toolbox for us to use as families and as professionals, but it should always be paired with the behavioral interventions that we're talking about. That, you know, just giving your child a stimulant medication is not going to be enough to solve the problem. That these are skills that we want to make sure we're fostering the development of as well. Um, and then consulting with a psychologist or a therapist, like an occupational therapist, to help with some of the development of, strat and, um, the, development of the strategies that are going to address the concerns that you guys have. So here are some of the resources that I have for you guys. These are books that I don't have any financial um, gain from at all, but I've heard from families and kind of experienced with myself I think can be very helpful um, to use. They're all written in a nice parent-friendly way. They're available at local bookstores or at the library. Um, the um, handout that you guys have about parent exec oh, excuse me, parent executive functioning skills comes from this book right here, Smart But Scattered. Um, and in this book, they have the same type of inventory for children of different ages. And so what you can do is sit down with this book and really look at what are your child's strengths and weaknesses with executive functioning skills, and being able to match those with your own, and then knowing the different interventions based on some of the slides that we've covered that you might be able to use. Um, and then some of the other resources that I've used. Questions or thoughts? I know we went a little bit over. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to comment on what they were mentioning before. I'm a special ed teacher, and I have a grandson with um, KS. And he, his biggest difficulty is working memory and executive functioning skills. And we made 
sure that when they go into the independent functioning part that they include that <laughs> as a deficiency and you include it in your IEP so that that way they are obligated by law to include strategies to deal with that. So include scaffolding in your IEP, that that is a strategy that needs to be done. And that kind of gets rid of that struggle with the teacher because it's in, her, in his IEP and they have to do it. Mm -hmm. And some of those other strategies. And I think that's a great point, is just, you know, making sure that you guys are advocates for your child. If you know that your child is likely to struggle with certain aspects of school, helping the school understand that and the teachers understand what they can do and that your child's not lazy or trying to be difficult, that these are things that are inherently a little bit weaker for them. Um, and I think that those are things that, you know, coming to the clinic can be very helpful. Neuropsychological evaluations can be very helpful. You know, sometimes it's hard as parents even to understand what is going on. Is this really a weakness or is there other, you know, another thing that's playing into this being an area of difficulty? And so having other professionals um, be involved in the evaluation of your child's strengths and weaknesses and giving you extra ideas I think can be very helpful. Um, I think my greatest struggle I think, so did all of you guys hear that question okay? Is this idea of, um, to me what I'm seeing it as is picking your battles as a parent. And, and what do you really focus on and what do you just know that this may be always an area of weakness for your child and that they may always need um, help with this. And I think that that's a fine line and it's something that you have to, you know, negotiate as a parent. You have to take the information that you're getting and really decide, you know, is this something I give up on or is it something that if I teach compensatory strategies that we might be able to at least help them be a little bit more independent. And I think that in a lot of ways, helping the child understand that they're, that that's an area of weakness for them and what they can do to um, address those concerns. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Um, and we all have developed ways to get around those problems. And I think that helping a, a child or an adolescent recognize those and be able to um, develop their own strategies is a way to help promote them to be more independent. And that's really what we all want, is this idea of a healthy, happy, confident 25-year-old. Yes, sir. I don't think there's a set answer that you have a cutoff mm -hmm. date. Every individual is different. You yeah. have to make that adjustment on your own with your child. You can't. I mean, yeah. I've been working at my son for almost 60 years now. Yeah. So. And I completely I agree. Get rid of him. <laughs> Which is good, right? We don't want to. And I agree. Like, I'm still learning different ways to be organized and to be planful and to not procrastinate on presentations and things like that. And that's something that it takes time and you do kind of continuously. So I'm um, recognizing that it's time for lunch. And so what I'm hoping is that I will be here for lunch. And I'm happy to talk with you guys if you want to come and talk with me afterwards. But I think I'll let the rest of you guys go to lunch. And then if there's anything that I can help specifically, please don't hesitate to talk to me. Thank you for your time.